Welcome. I'm Sharon Constanson. I am chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce based in the UK. And today I'm hosting a really popular series that we run through the year called the Global Citizen Series, which is bringing to you and highlighting key personnel in South Africa's history, um, its law, its education, and various other topics of interest that um, the University of the Free State are able to conjure up and for us to share with you. Um, I'm going to introduce Prof. Francis Peterson, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State and the one who is spearheading the In Conversation series we've been running now for two years. So on that note, uh, Prof. Professor P uh, Francis, I would like you to do all the talking and I'll leave the two of you to have some fun together and a good quality conversation. And I'll pick up some keynotes of interest and uh, questions at the last 15 minutes. See you shortly. Thank you very much, Sharon. And thank you for that introduction and for setting the scene. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure always to, to partner with the South African Chamber of Commerce and obviously through you, Sharon, uh, uh, and thank you for your support uh, in this series as well. So today is going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, I have uh, um, in, the, um, in the virtual room with me, Jots L.B. Sachs. And, and although Jot Sachs uh, does not need to, to, be, uh, to be introduced, uh, he's so well known to probably most of you, if not all of you, I wanted to, to just uh, uh, give you a little bit of a, of a synopsis of uh, Jot L.B. Sachs. So he's an activist, uh, a writer, a former judge of the Constitutional Court uh, of South Africa. And I think he served uh, during the period 1994 to 2009 as a judge uh, on the Constitutional Court. He began practicing as an advocate uh, um, at the Cape Bar uh, at a very early age of 20, uh, or young age, should I say, of 21, uh, defending people charged, <clears throat> charged under racial statutes and security laws. Uh, of the apartheid and apartheid era. Um, after two spells of being detained in solitary confinement without trial, uh, first for a period of, of about five months and then another three months, he went into exile uh, into the UK uh, where he completed his PhD at, uh, at Sussex University. Uh, um, in 1988, he lost his right arm and his uh, sight uh, in one eye when a bomb was placed in his car by South African security agents in Maputo, Mozambique. After the bombing, he devoted himself to the preparation for a new democratic constitution uh, for South Africa. So when he returned home from exile, he served as a member of the Constitutional Committee and the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress until the first uh, democratic elections in 1994. Uh, he is the author of several books, uh, including The Jail Diary of L.B. Sachs, uh, Justice in South Africa, Sexism and Law, Soft Vagents uh, um, of Freedom Fighter, and The Strange uh, Alchemy of Life and Law. His latest books are We, the People, Insights of an Activist Judged, uh, that was in 2016, and then Oliver Tumba's Dream in 2017. Now, very importantly, um, Judge L.P. Sachs uh, is a recipient, I think, of about 28 honorary doctor doctorates. Uh, but most importantly, one of, uh, one of those doctorates are from the University of the Free State. So, um, uh, LB, just LB Sex have indicated to me that I can just call him LB uh, because this is a conversation. So, LB, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for being here, and I'm certainly looking forward uh, to our to our con conversation. And I actually want to start off with um, a story that I've heard, and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna try to to just sort of articulate or sketch the interest at uh, the intro of the story. It's, it, 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 it's about you rushing to the, to the uh, Johannesburg airport. Uh, uh, um, you then have uh, run into a burly African man uh, and, and, and he, blocked, he blocked your way. Um, and then he threw his arms around you and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Now, I want to know, what is it all about? <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't say why, but I knew why. It, it was just after the Constitutional Court had given judgment in the Kandler case, where uh, it ordered that uh, Parliament had failed in its responsibilities to oversee the acts of President Jacob Zuma, and the president had failed to fulfill his functions as president by overspending uh, on the upgrading, security upgrading of his private home. And uh, this man, late middle aged African man, just, and I almost missed my plane, and he just said, thank you. I said, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. I've been off the court for five years. He just said, thank you. And he was expressing what I think was almost a national feeling of relief and joy that the constitution was being upheld, mm -hmm. that, that some kind of malpractice was being called out by the institution set up by the constitution to ensure that parliament functioned correctly and the president fulfilled his obligations correctly. It was a very wonderful moment for me because yeah. it wasn't personal to me, it was personal to my, my role as, as a judge on the court. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to come uh, uh, back a little bit later on the Constitutional Court. But I, I want to just to get a better understanding. We did talk about the Constitutional Court also in your introduction. Uh, in Bloemfontein, where we are, uh, uh, as the University of the Free State, we got the Supreme Court of Appeal, the SCA. Now, I also heard that uh, your interactions in the beginning with both the SEA and the Constitu Constitutional Court wasn't easy. Uh, uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, Albi? Yes, it, it was very, it, it's something that had to be handled with great sensitivity. The, the, it wasn't called the Supreme Court of Appeal then, or it hadn't been, it was the appellate division of the Supreme Court of South Africa was the top court in the land. And I remember as a young advocate in 1960 going up, very exciting, I'm going to the top court in the land, a Bloemfontein, and you spoke about Bloom and Bloemfontein. Now it's being in a way upstaged constitutionally by another court. And it wasn't a court with one or two um, of the judges in the Constitutional Court had been on the SCA. Justice, um, uh, I think Johan Krichler had served there uh, and Richard Goldstone had served there. But the other nine members, some of us hadn't been judges at all on any court. Uh, some of us were just law professors. Arthur Chaskelson had been at the bar. And then we had four judges, some of them you, Ishmael Mohammed, uh, Judge of Color, one of the very first, uh, and Tori Madala, also for about a year. So you had this very experienced court in Bloemfontein, and it's headed by Michael Corbett, one of South Africa's great judges uh, of highly respected, very forward-looking, completely in sync with the new constitution. Other of his colleagues, maybe not that same record on the one hand, and then on the other, in Johannesburg in temporary accommodation, uh, in a very unimpressive little, little courtroom, having the power <clears throat> to have the last word. So at that stage, the, the diplomacy was the, so I'll call it the Supreme Court of Appeal, shorthand, or that wasn't mm. always called that, would have the last word on all matters except constitutional matters. And constitutional matters would go, bypass them and come straight to the Constitutional Court in Johannesburg. It meant we couldn't overturn Bloemfontein. They were out of the loop. And I think many of the judges in Bloemfontein felt that, in fact, the Constitution is not all that important. Once you get rid of the apartheid laws, the common law can do everything. Mm. My, my great friend and colleague, Robin Murray, had that, that view. Uh, I think he was totally, utterly wrong because the Constitution said even the common law had to be developed in keeping with the spirit of the constitution. Anyhow, we were referred to as the judges in the green gown. 
because we had a separate gown. We wanted to separate ourselves from the old judiciary, which was very heavily implicated in upholding apartheid, although some judges brilliantly stood out against that. <clears throat> so that went on until two years later, the final constitution uh, was adopted. And now the, all the courts were brought in to handling constitutional matters, including the Supreme Court of Appeal. And we could overturn decisions of the Supreme Court of Appeal. I'm not sure that we ever did actually on constitutional matters. Sometimes they were bypassed. Sometimes we agreed. Sometimes we agreed for different reasons. Uh, and now, in fact, it's very common for judges from Grimfontein to serve part-time on the constitutional court, to bring the experience in Grimfontein onto the constitutional court, and to take back constitutional court experience back to Bloemfontein. Now I would say by and large relationships are very harmonious. And with Justice uh, Mandisa Maya, now the former head of the SEA, as the deputy chief justice, uh, somehow I wouldn't call it a marriage between the two courts because they're separate courts, but the, the, the bond I think is very, very strong. Soon okay. it's expected she'll be Chief Justice of South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Now that's fantastic. Uh, Justice Maya, in fact, had very good relationship also with our university and also our law faculty. And she, in fact, serves uh, uh, um, as, as a member of, of the faculty board of the Faculty of Law, because uh, we do have a representation from the outside sector as well on our faculty boards. And that's fantastic. But before I go into into you know what's happening in South Africa, uh, uh, um, I want to to just explore a little bit more with, through one question on the Constitutional Court. Uh, now you got eleven unelected judges. Uh, you strike down laws in a democratic society. You actually even tell a democratic elected uh, president what to do. Uh, how is that possible? <laughs> it's not only possible, it's necessary. And that's why that guy put his arms around me and hugged me. <laughs> because somebody was saying that constitution counts. The constitution matters. And we've got to remember who made the constitution. It was parliament. Parliament, the first democratically elected parliament. For the first time, the nation, everybody in the nation has a voice. And its function was precisely to draft a constitution that would be binding on South Africa down the line. And that wouldn't allow any incumbent body that happened to have the support of the electorate in the last elections to cling to power by diminishing constitutional rights, to overstep the line in terms of what the powers of parliament are when it comes to touching on certain fundamental themes, the rights of conscience and belief. Uh, if, if parliament starts telling people what to believe, uh, it's also important for fundamental rights of vulnerable groups that are not strongly represented in the political system. Most people don't like prisoners, but prisoners are human beings. And the Constitution says all human beings have certain fundamental rights. Uh, many people in our country, uh, elsewhere in the world, have a hostility towards people who love persons of their same gender. The Constitution says no. Sexual orientation can't be used to deny people their dignity and their humanity. So it's important for vulnerable groups it's important to prevent abuses of power by those in authority. And we saw in the Kandla case where Parliament was shielding the president who was building a swimming pool and a chicken run and uh, a, a small amphitheater with high walls he's entitled to for protection, other kinds of security. Somebody had to hold the line under the constitution and it was the constitutional court that did that. Uh, other areas, we've also played a very important role in, in uh, social and economic rights. If the education departments are not getting school books out, uh, the constitution kicks in and says, it's not up to you to decide, you've got to do it. If welfare payments are not being uh, made available to people, the court steps in to ensure that these things happen. Uh, if 
there's a problem with the housing program because there's no place for emergency housing that the, the court will step in for emergency housing. The most important case, and I think I, I've made the point, is the treatment action campaign case where the court ordered, said that the government was under a duty to make the drug nevirapine available to women about to give birth living with HIV. It would cut down the transmission of HIV by 50%, now it's by 95%. It saved, the court saved hundreds of thousands of lives because it upheld the right of access uh, to, to health services to be progressively realized uh, under the constitution with inevitable resources uh, by, by the state. So, so I'll be, uh, um, I, I just want to check, um, you, you know, Sorry, can I just add one little thing just for the sure. rhetorical point? Yeah, okay. The fact that the judges are not elected, in fact, is a guarantee of the independence. It's a virtue to be independent. If they were to be elected, they would come in beholden to those who would elected them. That's one problem. Or they'd be worried that they wouldn't be re-elected or their term would be brought short. So the fact they're not elected in, in the in the balancing out in the democratic process, you need the unelected body of people very carefully chosen after lots of scrutiny in very public way uh, with the right credentials uh, to ensure that this document called the constitution is obeyed by everybody, particularly by those in power. They must set the example of, of, of adherence to the constitution. Yeah, yeah. LB, can I can I ask? Uh, we obviously uh, knows what's happening in South Africa. We've talked about corruption, uh, uh, and we we even talk about the 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 the, the politics of uh, you know of power was in was in the the country. Uh, what is what is your view uh, as we move into the leadership conference of the ANC towards the end of the year? Uh, um, your view of the future of South Africa. Uh, um, you obviously came a long way. You have yeah, seen yeah. before 1994. Uh, can you just maybe share your views with us? Okay, well, let me, Francis, say right off. Uh, in 1994, it's actually, I think, quite an interesting story. It's the first democratic elections. And my whole life's been spent, my whole adult life, Seven, age 17, joining the defiance campaign uh, in 1952. And literally willing, like so many others, to give my life for the struggle. And that meant within the ANC. Mm -hmm. And now, suddenly, it's just before the elections. And we're thinking, who's going to be the first Minister of Justice? There are four of us from the Constitutional Committee of the National Executive. It's Zola Squia, Kata Asmao, Dala Omar, and L.B. Sachs. And I thought, am I going to be sitting there waiting for the phone to ring? <laughs> That's not what I'm fighting for. I hated that idea. So I decided I'm getting out of law. I've done enough with law. But if I can get onto the Constitutional Court, that would be amazing because that's carrying on what we were fighting for through the constitution <coughs> that embodied our values. So I stepped down from the, the ANC, first from the executive committee, after the elections from, from my branch. So I haven't been a member of the organization now since 1994. I follow through the press what's going on uh, and, and with great interest. But also being a judge, it means I don't comment on ongoing political matters. Mm. Um, uh, I can comment on anything in the world except the most interesting things, <laughs> you know, that, that might one day end up in court. Uh, so I don't do that. But I can tell you, how do I react now? For example, when the Zondra Commission report comes out, I think it's, it's an amazing document, an extraordinary thing. And I react with two completely opposite emotions. One is an emotion of horror, indignation, anger. These things happened. 
uh, the evidence is compelling and and uh, there it is horror the other is delight why delight it's coming out it's being exposed as being exposed not just because of some brave journalists or whistleblowers it's exposed because the government itself has established under the constitution the mechanisms to deal with issues of this kind. The public protector in the first place, Tuli Madonsela. Afterwards, the appointment of Raymond Zondo, Deputy Chief Justice, then now Chief Justice, to examine with powers given to him, resources given to him. It's an extraordinary process. So this is the, the binary character of South Africa. We're capable of crude, manipulation, stealing, theft, lies, and deceit. The other face of South Africa is we are capable of facing up to the truth, getting the truth out. And that's one of our great strengths, our constitution, and that we're a very open society. You can ask me that question. In the old days, it would be not heard of, the rector of the Free State University, asking questions like that, you would have been chucked out one way or another, <laughs> you know, even without the Bruderborn, you would have been gone. And I can speak now, the only thing that's zipping my mouth a little bit, zipping it up, is my, my duty as a judge not to be embroiled in, in, in uh, political matters, yeah. political matters too much. So I think that's more or less where I stand now. We got over much bigger problems than we have today. Apartheid was more than a problem. It was a huge, historically created, systematized, entrenched in, through law, through power, through force, through ideology, in all sorts of ways and brainwashing. And we got rid of it as a system. We haven't got rid of racism. We haven't got rid of unfair advantage and disadvantage, but we destroyed that system. And in the end, relatively peacefully, in a very intelligent way, and we emerged with this wonderful constitution. And I think South Africans are longing for honesty and dignity and decency and working together and finding solutions. How it's to be found, that, that's not, not for me to say, uh, but the will to find it, uh, the eagerness and the mechanism the constitution gives us, gives me hope. The other thing that gives me hope is the young people I meet. I met many at University of the Free State. There's a brightness, uh, a sense of curiosity, an eagerness. And okay, many want to say, how can I get rich? How can I get powerful? But by and large, it's people saying, how can I get a nice job doing something for the nation, for my family, for other people? And how can I be more proficient at what I'm doing? Uh, and how can I work with others in teams and so on? We've got all those qualities. Uh, so that's that's what gives me a sense of, of, of positivity. Okay. Albie, you're talking about young people. And, and, and in fact, I want to, to ask a question in relation to universities uh, um, and, and institution of higher learning. Uh, what what would be your advice uh, to the university sector or to institutions of higher learning in strengthening constitutional democracy? What 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 would you advise universities to do? I, I think, in a sense, the constitution should come into every sector, even I don't know why I say even engineering. Uh, it, it should be, I don't like the idea of saluting the flag. Mm. You know what I mean? That sort of obedience. Or, or, you know, it shouldn't be obedience. It shouldn't be rote. But what does the constitution mean? What does it require? What possibilities does it give? And especially the values of the constitution. You know, the, the preamble comes right at the beginning. And then the foundational values and then the Bill of Rights. And I think that should be part and parcel of, of um, 
uh, almost admission to the university, understanding mm -hmm. of it. And then in health, if you're starting to be a doctor, fine, you've got to know about microbes uh, and, and preventive medicine and all that. But you should also know about the right to health care and the implications that has for health services and for the vocation of, of, of a doctor. When it comes to engineering, again, these themes come in of we are a nation. Everybody should benefit from the expertise and the scientific knowledge. Clearly in the arts, uh, it's no accident. I say it's not no accident. Maybe it was an accident. We have wonderful artwork at the Constitutional Court of, of South Africa in Johannesburg. Uh, and 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 just former Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng uh, wasn't so happy with that when he went to Bloemfontein to be at the inauguration of a new building extension to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Apparently he said, well, at least it looks like a court. Uh, we didn't <laughs> want a court that looked like a court in Johannesburg. We wanted a court that looked like a friendly place where everybody was welcome and not a kind of a citadel for judges to be aloof and, and cut off from the rest of the population. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's good to have good to have both. So um, uh, I think, in that sense, the uh, that's number one. Number two, the historians in all the universities should be telling the story of how we got the constitution. Uh, I was at a wonderful book launch at UWC uh, yesterday evening where Professor Andre Udendahl uh, launched a book uh, dealing with how Oliver Tambo laid the foundations of our constitution, 1985 to 1990 in Lusaka. It's a story, it's virtually unknown in South Africa and the world. I, I helped Andre with documents and some of the editing. And it was great to see the people filling the auditorium and Jabul and Debeli, uh, uh, Trevor Manuel, people who've been in the struggle, they're just sitting quietly, not recognized, no kind of protocol, remembering the UWC of the struggle days. Uh, and I threw out the, the challenge to the historians, the political scientists, we don't know our own narrative. Uh, and, and there's a huge role to be played by, by scholars to do the research the Constitutional Hill Trust now working with, with NASA, the National Archives, has, has digitized all the documents of CODESA uh, and of the Constitutional Assembly. They'll soon be publicly available. Many of us are still alive. We've got stories to tell. It's, it's a beautiful, wonderful story of, of intelligence, of, of, of thoughtfulness, of firmness on principle, of engagement. Uh, that that's another way universities uh, universities uh, can help in a very, very direct way. And it's a very heavy emphasis on those of us who were there to yeah. now help to animate all this documentation and to get the story of how the Constitution was made, to get the story out. Because it will be something beautiful, not only for the world, but for South Africans who are losing faith how we overcame what seemed insurmountable difficulties, how we surmounted them. Yeah, now that's fantastic. In fact, Andre Wittendahl, we, uh, 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 our Faculty of Humanities at the University of the Free State will be hosting him early in the new year uh, to, to talk about his book. And I presume that we will also have uh, a, a, a lecture hall uh, full, with, full to capacity uh, to discuss that. Uh, um, and, and, and I do agree with you, LB, in terms of our young minds, our next generation of, 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 of citizens uh, that is eager to, to learn, eager to, uh, to understand. Uh, we recently ran on a, um, at the university a competition on corruption, uh, um, try to hear from our final year students and our, all our postgraduate students across the university what practical uh, uh, suggestions they would put on the table to curb uh, uh, corruption. And, and, and besides sensitizing it, uh, there were just fantastic proposals that came through. And we had some judges, uh, retired judges, 
to uh, to judge uh, the the quality uh, of of those submissions. But talking about and, and I, for one moment, I'm just going to take you take you take you a little bit back. One of our greatest sons in South Africa and also in the Free State is Brown Fisher, uh, mm. uh, and obviously I know that he was a very good friend friend of you. Are there things uh, um, perhaps of Brown that you think uh, um, underpins our, our our constitution and 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 that South Africa, the Free State, South Africa, and the world should be aware of, aware of? About this, 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 this proud son uh, that we had coming from the Free State. Well, Brown, Brown was very extraordinary in many ways. Uh, he, he came from this very uh, uh, prestigious Afrikaans, white Afrikaans family. Uh, the grandfather had been Prime Minister of the Orange River Colony, I think. Uh, his father had been very distinguished judge, uh, and and interestingly, his father had been to the old Fort Prison where General de Wet was locked up uh, in 1914 to defend General de Wet. Brahm was afterwards going to defend the treason trialists. Brahm was afterwards thrown into prison himself. Uh, there's so much in that story because people from all different backgrounds came into this constitutional project. Uh, and Brown was so loved in the struggle in the community. Uh, and it helped those of us, those people inside the ANC who were saying, our struggle is not against a race, it's against a system. Because he was proof it's against a system. And anybody who's against that system can join us. But in addition to all that, he was an outstanding lawyer, uh, a very deep legal thinker, uh, a brilliant advocate, and plus all that, he uh, uh, was also, and his wife Molly, also from the Smuts family, another very distinguished uh, Afrikaans family. They were just superb human beings. Uh, I hope I don't sound patronizing. Uh, it's not patronizing. It, it's a deep sense of appreciation I have. It's something in Afrikaner culture, a kind of refinement and a dignity and a sensitivity that comes out in many, many different ways. I've noticed amongst the intelligentsia. Uh, if you get the people who broke away from supporting apartheid and racism, carried with them a very lovely sense of relationships, very close to Ubuntu, mm. of, of a delicacy of interpersonal relationships, the interdependence of people, uh, a kind of a respectfulness for others. And maybe having come from a community that's known oppression themselves after the anglo Boer War, the South African War, and destitution, and having known what it's like to be diminished and your language treated as an inferior language, uh, and people to be snot-nosed about you in this whole imperial world. Uh, somehow, Brahm embodied all the, those fine positive aspects. Uh, so it wasn't as though he shed being an Afrikaner to become a Democrat. He brought the fine qualities that I'm referring to uh, into the struggle in his own particular way and was very loved for that and very respected for that. So it's for his, his passion, his, if you like, his revolutionary activities, for his legal skills, but also for his great humanity and kindness. Uh, these are the qualities. When, when I get off the plane at Brom Fisher Airport, I get a lift every 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 single time fantastic uh i'll be and and we at the moment uh, are putting together a scholarship uh, for, uh, uh probably in our faculty of law on brown fisher and uh, i know that uh, the university is busy uh, looking for for some people to support that scholarship uh, so that that name can continue and the qualities that you just Define that fits also into the constitution, uh, but 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 should be shared 
uh, specifically to with our future generation. Absolutely fantastic. Now, I know that, you know, in these conversations, uh, LB, the time, I always have to watch the time. But but there's a, there's probably two questions I want to ask, which is not necessarily serious, that serious questions. Uh, the one is, uh, in fact, they're all related to 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 your movie star type of status uh, in, in in a way. And um, uh, the one is the the movie that was is, is, I think is called uh, Soul Vengeance in the New South Africa. Uh, maybe just uh, um, a few comments on that, and then uh, in the same way, the second question. Is that uh, uh, you also you also uh, are, are hanging out with some of the top movie stars like uh, George Clooney and Amal? So I wanted you to just just talk about the uh, the inaugural Clooney Foundation uh, uh, um, uh, award. Uh, I think the Clooney Foundation inaugural award and what it actually means to you, but also means to uh, to society in general. This came about by total accident, uh, and, and the connector, in fact, with, with uh, Amal and George Clooney was Sonia Sotomayor, the U.S. Supreme Court judge, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she came to Cape Town to be in conversation with me at a public lecture, it's called the Rabinovitz Lecture, uh, and she felt she didn't have enough chance to speak to me. She said, come to New York, and we'll put on something for you there. So. I had a very lovely session with her at New York University. And she said, by the way, can you and your wife, Vanessa, come for coffee tomorrow night, it's the night afterwards, to meet a former law clerk of mine, that's of hers, and her husband. So the next night we're there and the former law clerk comes, uh, it's Amal Clooney and her husband <laughs> is George Clooney. <laughs> and we just hit it off. And from then onwards, uh, Amal would email me and invite me to do a number of things. I wasn't available to do that. And eventually saying, uh, George and I are setting up a foundation and we'd like to give annual awards for people who fought for justice. Would you mind if uh, the first award went to you? And I said, OK. And that followed up. Would you mind if other people got the awards as well? And we want to call them the LB Sachs. Uh, uh, Justice Award, and I said, okay. And then last in that sequence is, uh, George has said that L.B. Sachs Justice Award is very clumsy, clunky. Would you mind if we called it the L.B.s? <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> I laughed. I mean, what would you think if somebody said we're going to have the best, best uh, vice chancellor in the world, we call them the Francis, <laughs> and give them a little model. Uh, but but I agreed. Uh, and, and there was a super ceremony just about 10 days, two weeks ago, at the New York Public Library. And I got a gorgeous hug and gave a gorgeous <laughs> hug to Michelle Obama. Oh, yeah, I saw so that. I'm sure you wouldn't that. mind being hugged by Michelle Obama. Uh, and and she made a lovely, beautiful speech. And I said, hey, she's talking about me. Uh, Meryl Streep presented uh, uh, another one of the awards. And it wasn't just reading from a script or learning a line. She clearly had invested herself. Mm. It was justice for, 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 for journalists. Uh, Julia Roberts also. Very lovely introduction to somebody else. So there was a great sense of occasion. Uh, and 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 uh, I still haven't quite got over it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but but just briefly on the on the sort of vengeance uh, in the new South Africa, the 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 movie that's yes. been made. That, was that's made. not a movie. That's a documentary. A documentary. A documentary. It was made by Abby Ginsberg from Berkeley, California, uh, a lawyer who became a filmmaker, uh, and that theme sort of vengeance came from a thought that popped into my head when I was recovering from the bomb in London uh, London Hospital, and I get a note that says, don't worry, Comrade Alby, we will avenge you. And I think avenge me, we're going to cut off the arm blind in one eye if we yeah. get freedom, if we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, that will be my soft vengeance. Mm. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And in a sense, my life from then onwards became one of soft vengeance. 
coming back to South Africa, helping to write the constitution. One of just scores, hundreds, literally hundreds of people writing the constitution. That soft vengeance, it's much more powerful than hard vengeance. Uh, Getting the constitution, getting onto the court, deciding to build the court in the heart of the old prison, the old fort prison, that soft vengeance, it's turning a sword into a plowshare. Uh, and, And so when Abby had to think of a title for that documentary film, it was just after I'd left the court she made it, uh, the theme Soft Vengeance, LB Saxon, the New South Africa, uh, yeah. cropped up. I might say it won the Peabody Award uh, in the Fantastic. United States for, yeah, for yeah. the quality of her filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. So, LB, we can carry on uh, for quite a long time. I, I think in this conversation, I clearly could see your the forgiveness that you that you exhibited, uh, um, your 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 strong uh, uh, focus on on justice, and 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 I probably extend it to social justice as well. Um, the fact that 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 the the positiveness about our country, and the fact that that you know we will work through where we are at the moment. Um, the message that you that you have put forward to our young, our young, uh, our youth uh, that's at the moment uh, all over sitting at, at institutions of higher learning in other organisations, um, trying to say that you know this is what you could look out for and this is what we expect you to behave uh, and to exhibit in a in 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 a in a in in the future society now i know that there are various questions on the chat box uh, uh and i did say to uh, uh our, our our sort of host uh, sharon constantian for the from the south african chamber of commerce that i'm going to give back to her uh, about 15 minutes before uh for her to to also have the opportunity to share some of those questions that were on the Q&A. Uh, it's now 15 minutes before. Uh, I probably would have asked her uh, just, just, just not go to the Q&A so that we can continue with our conversation. But, but I think it's important also to hear uh, what the audience have to say. But from my side, uh, I'll be indeed always a pleasure to engage with you. And I know that we will, we're will we going to do a lot of these engagements uh, going forward. Uh, Sharon, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you and, and, uh, and, and all of the best. And thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Francis, I have to say your timekeeping is impeccable. Thank you so much for that. Um, you are welcome to stay present with us. You do not have to run away. Um, Judge Albi Sachs, it's been a fascinating time listening to you. And I want to ask a a sort of more personal question from myself first, if I may. You covered it in many elements in the conversation that you've had with us, but what drives you today to make a difference? How are you making a difference and what drives you to that? My wife says I'm, I'm, I'm a workaholic. It's my addiction. Uh, it's not true. I'm actually by nature very lazy, but I'm inspired. Uh, it's been an amazing journey and it doesn't stop. Every time I settle down, okay, I've done my bit. Now I'm just recording the past. This mad thing comes along. We're going to create the Albies. It's, you know, it comes out, comes from nowhere, uh, and and it's fun and it's joyous. And I, and I think one of the things now, wherever I go, and I'm going to say it now, the human rights community tends to be very gloomy and long faces, uh, and quite correctly, it dames and shames and denounces. But where's the fun, the energy, the vitality, the things that makes us full human beings? And I'm discovering I'm getting more and more of that, not less and less of that. So in a sense, it's fun. You know, it, 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 it's fun to be 87. Uh, it, it's fun to be recording the past. It's fun to be on programs like this. It's fun to be with young people. And it's damn good for my immune system. Uh, 
uh, even when I got COVID, it was kind of very mild. So it's like I can't stop and I don't want to stop. Well, it's uh, like any muscle in your body. If you make the brain lazy, it's not going to be performing very well, is it? So you seem to be keeping yours extremely busy. Yes. It, whatever it is, is keeping my brain busy. Yeah. Um, Obi, you were talking about recording the past. Um, I gather there's um, a, a, a book coming out in due course. Two things I'd like to ask in that relation, and links to one of the questions that has been asked from the floor. How do you feel when you start recording some of these things from the past? Is it just a bit of history, or does it bring back memories like you're reading a diary? How does it actually feel for you as a human being, and how does it influence the way you're writing it? And who should read this book and when? Yes, in fact, I, I worked closely with Andrew Odendahl on the book, and it meant telling him this is what we were saying, this is what we were feeling. Uh, and, and it's a terrific story, uh, as a kind of almost an adventure story with an intellectual twists and turns. Uh, Oliver Tambo comes through very, very powerfully in it. This man couldn't be more different from me if you tried, you know, I'm growing up very cosmopolitan city of Cape Town. He grew up in a deep rural area, Ponderland was called then. Uh, he had tribal scars. Uh, when I was blown up, I still remember the ANC rep in, in Canada saying, uh, excuse the language, he said, the Boers have Africanized you. They've given you scars like, like Tambo. He was deeply religious. I was secular with a uh, like to feel a strong spiritual quality, but not in religious terms. We loved each other. Uh, and Oliver Tambo was sitting in a tiny Cessna airplane, flying from one African couple to another uh, country to another, meeting the leaders to say, this is the Rory Declaration. This is our road to freedom in Africa. Uh, and it gets picked up by the organization African Unity, the Non-Aligned Movement, the Commonwealth, the General Assembly adopts it by acclamation. At the time of Reagan, at, at the time of, of Margaret Thatcher, by acclamation, the roadmap to New South Africa. It's a marvelous story, but Oliver Tambo collapses. He has a stroke. He never fully recovers from it. So it's a very human story, and I love being able to be party to telling the story to a new generation and learning many details myself. Uh, and there was humor in it, and there was tragedy in it, and I'm blown up in the middle of the story. It's melodramatic. And as you see, when I'm speaking to you now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm animated. So it's, it's living the past to communicate it and share it with others. And then when people say, what advice would you give me as a young person? I say, the only advice I'd give you is don't listen to the advice from oldies like me, but listen to our stories and pick up from those stories what you can, things that might 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 be of interest to you. Thank you, Albi. And you do make me smile. And you do bring back actually some of those emotional memories and words you've been using. And I'm thinking, I was around then. I remember all those people, names, places, organizations, discussions, and you realize how you are so connected to that as a human being. And we talk about being who we are, being the pyramid of our experience. We sit on the top of our pyramid. Well, you've just identified a bunch of my pyramid I've long forgotten about. So just to take that to an education level, how should today's youngsters be learning about your story, Mandela's story, Oliver Tambo's story? Yeah. All the things that were done that make South Africa the possible massive success it can be, how did they learn that all races, all genders, all ages, um, many generations have actually made South Africa what it is today? How did they learn that? Well, the contribution I can make to that is, is by uh, I've actually got a very, very positive outcome of the Clooney event is Ford Foundation are backing the Clooney project uh, and they providing resources for me to create what's called the LB collection. And that will be uh, stories I still have to tell, uh, stories I've told, 
uh, events I was involved in, quiet, semi-secret dealings uh, in, in our little office in the backyard of a sanitary lane in Lusaka, um, telling those stories, photographs from the time. I've just seen a photograph of the last time I had two arms holding up the ANC constitutional guidelines in, in Lusaka. The debates over gender, the woman saying, you know, you speak about 300 years of racial oppression. What about a thousand years of gender oppression? Are we going to hand over power from one gang of men to another gang of men? Raising very, very sharp issues, you know, bringing all those things in, telling those stories. So that's my contribution to people having the information and hopefully told in a lively, active way. It's amazing what one can do now with virtual uh, communication. Uh, getting a team together so that it's not just a collection as as, as one uh, 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 American museum person said, uh, the museum is not a place for things to go and die. It's got to be a lively place with information, uh, data, evidence is alive and real and challenging. Wow, that is very inspiring. Thank you very much for that. Just another um angle that is taken often by people, valid or not, I'm not going to try and judge it in this point because we've seen the perspective and the questions from both perspectives. Have we changed one um, process um, of apartheid for the reverse of it in terms of BEE, or have we created a um, change that was required, has it outlived its possible value? And how can we look after, and you made reference a moment ago to gender. How does the constitution look after gender-based violence, for example, which is still extremely prevalent, even though we have equality of our genders? So between gender equality, we don't have a law. We just have some unpleasant outcomes still. But if you look at um, racism, have we reversed it? Is it appropriate? Has it done the right thing? Should it be? I'm asking that as a I'm combining three questions together. There. Yes, yes, yes. Well, let me separate the answer into two. The gender dimension. Uh, our constitution is the most gender sensitive constitution in the world by far. It's the only one that puts non sexism at the same level as a fundamental value as non racism. Uh, it takes a very clear stand, not in a clause called rights for women, but freedom rights against gender-based violence. Uh, no, everyone has the right not to be subjected to violence from public or private sources. That's GBV. It takes a very clear position on the issue that's tearing the United States apart now, and that's the right to terminate pregnancy. People have the right to make decisions concerning reproduction. That was built into the constitution in 1996, uh, democratically elected, accepted by 83% majority uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, social and economic rights are the rights that women fight for the hardest, more often than men, not just civil and political rights. Uh, children's rights, it was the women's group in parliament that pushed very hard for very powerful rights for children. So uh, the other ways, customary law is respected and is treated as an original source of law, like the old Roman Dutch law. But like Roman Dutch law, it's subject to the constitutional equality principles. So the courts developed the notion of living customary law that takes account that two of the judges or the, uh, somebody like Bess and Kabendi or, or Yvonne Mofora sitting up on the court now are not subject to the patriarchal control of their husbands uh, as somebody, an African woman in a rural area. Uh, patriarchy, from that point of view, is anti-constitutional. The court has said, said, said as much. So in very many different areas, uh, the constitution is strongly affirmative. It doesn't stop gender-based violence, but it does provide at least a constitutional 
a, a way of not allowing men to say privacy means don't come into my bedroom. If I'm killing my wife, you can come in and you must come in. In terms of the, the suggestion that taking steps to deal with the uh, huge inequalities created systematically and by law under apartheid, taking steps, taking direct account of race and gender and disability is reverse discrimination. The constitution is clear. It authorizes those steps uh, in 9.2 in of, of the constitution. Uh, and it's hugely different from apartheid. Apartheid, first of all, was achieved by conquest, dispossession, oppressive laws. The changes are brought about through parliament, through law publicly debated, totally different. Secondly, the courts have stepped in. If the way it's applied is oppressive, uh, uh, and it happened with, with in the police force where a white woman uh, was looked over, looked, was overlooked for a very senior position in the police force. There was no one else to fill that position. The police said, but we have to give prominence to, to black people of African descent who are very underrepresented uh, in that particular sector. And the court said, no, there was nobody with her qualifications. She must get the job. So even that's, that process is under uh, uh, constitutional scrutiny. Uh, and uh, so it, it's really overcoming the entrenched, deeply entrenched forms of systematic exclusion that there has to be an answer. My own view now as a human being and not speaking as a judge, uh, but I, uh, one very prominent political person, not from the ANC, is if you don't see that I'm black, you don't see me. Uh, and, and we have to take account of the realities of the people who bear the brunt of all the hardships in South Africa the most happen to be black. Uh, the people who are living in the least salubrious conditions happen to be black. The people who struggle the hardest to get ahead for all sorts of reasons uh, happen to be black. And you have to take account of that. You have to take sensible, rational, but clear, carefully calibrated uh, very proactive measures to overcome that. The biggest problem now, of course, in South Africa is not the overt racism in, in terms of racial politics, the covert racism, no. the, the assumptions, the things that people aren't even aware of, just as with sexism. It's so often just there, it's hidden. Uh, it's, it's worse because it's almost automatic as though it comes from nature, not from law. Okay. Uh, and, and we're grappling with those issues. What, what I like about South Africa in this respect is we often get angry, we rude with each other, but out there in the open. In other countries, it's denied. It's denied here. It, it, it's at least acknowledged. <laughs> there are questions piling in. We have to stop. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. And to all of those that we didn't get your questions, I am sorry. But we could be talking about the Zondo Commission. We were talking about the ANC's goals, SEOs, uh, boards of directors, and, and, and. So there are plenty of questions that have gone missed, which I think means we're going to have to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. It's been fascinating from our perspective. Sorry to the audience so late, but I see most of you are still here with us. Thank you very much. Um, Francis, may I hand over to you to do the close and the thank you of Albie Sachs, and then I'll just do the final close. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity again, Albie, to thank you for, uh, for, for, for being so open in this conversation. Uh, it was really a conversation rather than an interview where where we where we ask questions and 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 thank you very much for doing that and and Sharon also for you I, I I'm looking forward again to a another another event another similar event uh, probably in in November mm -hmm. uh, but thank you also for for hosting us and and the way that you also engage with with us in such a professional manner thank you very much to you and the South African Chamber of Commerce Francis. Professor, thank you very much for that. You're going to have me blushing here in a room full of people thinking, why is she blushing? Um, thank you very much. 
Um, Judge Albi, thank you very, very much for your insight. And I can echo your transparency, your honesty, but I'd like to add to that your energy, your fun, your dynamism, your drive. Those things you don't often see, and I'm going to be really ages to say, of a person of your age, but you make it your business to mix with people of all kinds. And it really does show in your energy for life. And I think it's a lesson to all of us. And what I have enjoyed today was memory lane. You took us down memory lane. I didn't like all the, the roads you went down. They were quite unpleasant memories in many cases which sort of brings us up and makes us remember what has gone before and how much has changed. And to all the youth of today, I hope you find a way to understand how so many have done so much for us to have the country we have today and to help us get the country we want for tomorrow. So, Albi, thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate it. And to those of you who are still with us, really do appreciate it. Goodbye.